Hello, everyone. Welcome to Word Funk. I am Leon Thomas. I am joined by Austin Yorsky and Johnny Maloney. Abolish ice. Uh, so, uh, how are you guys feeling this week? Nope. Okay. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> I, my like for a second there, it, it looked like my uh, my audacity just froze, but it's still running. Uh, we're still Good. we're still up and going. So nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. Still getting waveforms. Um, I'm I. Mm, you know. It was just a lot. As, kid, as well as we... As, uh, that. <clears throat> That's how I'm dooming. Do you guys want to maybe start this recording over and try to take another run at this one? Because we, <laughs> we we whiffed real hard. No, like, no, that's, no. It, that's, that's the part of the charm. you're going to get out of me the next time as well. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 things to talk about in my sticky note, so I don't know how much we want to linger in sad world. Yeah, it's, it's, been, okay. it's been two weeks since we've recorded together. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's on me. I was out of town, like very, very far out of town. I, I, which that, that's the, which the I want to hear about, I'm... and I hope you have some things to say about it. Yeah, I, that's that's the thing I'm going to talk about uh, this week. So, I mean, it it was fun, so I can talk about that See, and start us off on a fun Austin, night. we can start on a fun thing this week. Yeah. Um, I uh, went to California to go to VidCon, and um, it it didn't start well, but now, it got... Pro- now, VidCon is, is really... It's just a convention for people who are like video content producers. Am I right? Uh, no, it is for people who are video content producers and also their fans. Okay. So there's three, there's three tiers, and the first tier is community, which means you're a fan. The second tier is a creator, which means you're me. And the third tier is your industry, which means you probably run, like, a multi-channel network or something like that. Um, and I was the second one, which means my badge was purple, which I was very excited about. Um, so <laughs> that, that's what that happened. Uh, I had, I stayed up all night and got on my plane. Um, and then I, I got there and I just wanted to sleep, but I also wanted to register. Um, and I, uh, I did that. And then I realized that Wednesday at VidCon is just a big wank. Uh, nothing really happens so on Wednesday. Yeah, it's the first. It's the first day of the con, kind of, but nothing's open except for a few things. Um, but everyone like registers that day to get that over with, because otherwise there's a line. Um, so I I, de- I dealt with that and I got my badge and everything. So that was nice. But it didn't make for an exciting day uh, that I stayed up all night to have. Um, Thursday was only mildly better because um, for me, VidCon was just about. Um, Going to seminars and things and learning uh, certain ins and outs of uh, YouTube that uh, even I don't know at this point. Palms. <laughs> no, no, really, just uh, listening to uh, people the talk about this. Handshake. Oh my god, talk about the secrets of the algorithm, which constantly changes. That's that's everything. That's everything uh, that it is to being a YouTuber. It's uh, trying to figure out what the algorithm is doing this week uh, and trying to maximize your hits. Slipping, slipping people a fin. Oh my god! Um, so I did. I did, I was like, okay, I'm gonna hunker down. I'm gonna go to like six of these today because I have all day. I did two, and I was like, done. <laughs> That's a, that is quite enough. Did you ever? Of... Did you ever walk up to doors with like Judas windows and like whisper swordfish inside? Oh my god! <clears throat> uh, you you need to stop. <laughs> um, so. But yeah, they um like I went to a couple panels and ninety five percent of what they said was stuff I already knew, um because I'm not like a big shot or anything who knows all the hotkeys. Um, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just it's just the that keyboard, like I the keyboard I, shortcuts, Leon. The I I, shortcuts. I I I spend a lot of time googling how do I make my channel better and following a lot of advice. So when I went to panels about how to make your channel better um, and, like, uh, navigate copyright and all that stuff, it was stuff that I already known because I spent way too much time figuring, trying to figure this out already. But I did learn a couple uh, things that were helpful, and I'll try to implement those, and that's good. Um, but still, like, by Thursday, I was like, man, I came all the way to California for this. Um, 
I, you know, and I, that... I diced with the possibility of like jumping in my car and driving down <laughs> to see you. Oh, but I wasn't because I can I can make California in a day. Like that's that's still quite a that's still quite a ride. Oh, but I, but, but like... I love long distance drives. They're fantastic. Get my MP3 oh, player, just plug it into the car and go. Mm, Plus, no. you know, I, I, think, <laughs> I think I still have some friends in California in places. And I could in be places. like, I'm in your state. <laughs> Give me a place to stay. But I didn't. <laughs> right. I didn't. No, nah, I can sleep in the back of my car. No big deal. But I didn't okay. go because of uh, health reasons. Yeah. Um, that, that's okay. Um, uh, Thursday was just business. Friday, by Friday morning, I was like, this is kind of a bust, isn't it? Uh, but then Friday afternoon, I think, uh, after I did another couple panels, I was on the – I did a networking session, which is quite different. There's no, like, audience. Um, it's just a few tables, and my networking session was with other video essayists. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to gonna sit on this uh, – at this table and talk about stuff we we should be doing. So it was and just I was like very... a roundtable situation or like a mirror yeah, there were, there, or like there, – there, there was a room and there were three there were I think three round tables and I was in one of them. Okay. And I was very fortunate because on in my table there were two people who were subscribed to my channel. So oh. I felt I felt I felt mildly like a big shot for a second there. Um uh anybody, I also was anybody we would know? Um no, the uh, well, one is just getting started, but uh I I did end up checking out out her channel and it's quite good and she is good. She did a, a video essay about um uh, Jurassic World that I rather liked, and I ended up subscribing to her channel. Also, a a longtime fan uh, of mine was sitting there, um, and uh, he seemed really nice, uh, David. And um, and also at at the uh, table was Ollie from Philosophy Tube, and I am subscribed to his channel. Mm. I don't think I mentioned that to him, but we did talk briefly uh, at the table, and it was nice. Um, so after that, I was like, okay, this wasn't a waste of time. And then I got invited to a party. And I'm like, this is the shit I'm here for. This will be great. Um, I felt like shit by the time I got to the party, though. Why? <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't have a car. Uh, and I had to walk. It, I was either going to pay, pay another expensive taxi, because they're horrible there, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, getting, getting from the uh, hotel – I mean, sorry – from the uh, airport to the hotel cost me fifty dollars. Right. Just to, and it's like it's not even that far. Um, but so that's how long California. was the walk to the party? It was supposed to be fifteen minutes, which is not a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. But the GPS was wrong. It took me fifteen minutes to get to the gate of the neighborhood of the party. Okay. And then <laughs> and an I additional... had to walk. Not another another like twenty minutes of walking in in by the way in the hot sun in summer. In California, and I and I don't know. It messed with my head, and by the time I got there, I didn't feel good. You didn't get heat so, stroke, did you? No, I just I got I did end up getting a mild sunburn while I, I was out there, but like it doesn't hurt. It just uh, it just looks red. I'm trying not, to imagine Leon with a tan now. It's not good. I it's really bad. All right. Um, so you felt I like shit when you got to this party. Yeah. So I wasn't really up for socializing, but I was. I, I kind of sat down, like, well, I made it. I, I, I'm getting some brief people-to-people -people FaceTime now. Uh, and I saw a friend of mine, uh, Zach, uh, better known uh, on YouTube as R.L. King. He does video essays as well, and his are good. And we were able to catch up a little. And then I told him, I really need to go now. <laughs> and he was like, no, it's cool. And he gave me his card, and I gave him mine. Uh, because that is, all, that is a thing you do at, at a convention. I have cards, by the way. Uh, nice. So there's that. Um, they're what, very what nice. What kind of gauge? <laughs> they, uh, I, they, they look like um, the background of my uh, YouTube, like the banner, but then it has all my information on it. Um, not all my information, like my social security number, but it has my the pertinent information. Does that it have you your anatomical measurements? It has nothing like that. Um, That's a shame. So by my, by the end of by the, by the time I walked back to my hotel, I'm like, this was okay but i don't know if i'm gonna come back and then i went to disneyland and it was great um i picked like this is just this is, is this just something that you decided to do you were like i'm going to disneyland 
No, I thought here's my plan. My plan was this: either I was gonna I, I was gonna be either a social butterfly, and I was gonna have so much fun that I was just gonna spend the rest of all the time at VidCon, or I was gonna think it was only okay and go to, and ditch and go to Disneyland on the last day. And I ditched and went to Disneyland on the last day, all right. which is apparently a thing that almost everyone does anyway. Um, so I was I was not in bad company. But uh, but here's the thing: I picked the best day to do it, and not by like on purpose i it was just by accident the other disney theme park uh disney california adventure like right across the street from disneyland had their grand opening of like a new section for pixar oh. there so so everyone was there and i was at disneyland going on rides that usually take two hours to get into that took like 10 minutes um so i w- i did everything on my list by noon and I had 12 more hours until the park closed. How much did so you I eat? Did, uh, I ate a fair amount. I had uh, a Mickey-shaped uh, ice cream and um, some, like, um, fast food kind of stuff. You know, it's it's not that, it's that kind of dining, you well, know. Well, I mean, um, yeah. It was okay. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I eventually just said, well, I'll just go on literally everything else. Uh, and I did, basically. What was your um, favorite? Uh, it was it was either well yeah I will say my favorite one was the Indiana Jones ride, um, it was great, uh, it it just it was just really well done and the music was there and I felt like it was I love rides where you um, it's not just like wood and metal and like ooh I'm falling but like there's like a story and stuff mm-hmm. and you you guide through it and Disney has a lot of that stuff yes so I was into that my biggest disappointment was that my normally my favorite ride cuz I've I've only been to Disney World uh before but my favorite ride ever going always going there was the haunted mansion mm-hmm. so of course I went to the haunted mansion in Disneyland which is nearly identical um the problem was um Basically, when you get go in the Haunted Mansion, you you enter a room for anyone who ha- who has never been on it. You enter a room, and um, like a, a a narrator who with a spooky voice starts telling you the story of what you're about to do. And I'm like, ooh, like this is the kind of shit I'm into. Um, but here's the thing: in days past, what would happen is you would listen to the narrator, and everyone would be like like kind of whispering, like, oh no, what's happening? You know, it's scary, but. I I don't know. Everyone's like fucking jaded or something. So everyone just talked over the narrator, except for one guy who, in in addition to talking over the narrator, was reciting the narration because he wanted everyone to know how big of a Disney dork he is that he has memorized the narration to the Haunted Mansion. And it put me in kind of a bad mood. But by the time I, uh, you know, started the ride proper, the ride proper was fine. But it did break down. I can, I, but uh, I can see how that would be atmosphere breaking in more yeah, ways than yeah. one. Yeah, it took me out of it. Uh, the ride broke down, but it was fine because it meant we got to stay in the seance room for a while and listen to the <laughs> and listen talk, to talk like to, ev- talk to dead spirits that you've longed to communicate with for eons. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the other ride that broke down was Space Mountain, but apparently that's a good thing. People like desire Space Mountain to break down while they're in it because what happens is they turn all the lights on, and then the ride, and then after you know they they deal with it and it's safe, the ride continues, but with the lights on. So it is scary as hell when the lights are on because you see how close you are to all this metal stuff about to hit you the whole time as opposed to it being dark and you're just you just assume that everything's fine it's not fine so were you on space mountain when it broke down yes exactly yeah i was on space mountain it broke down i was like oh no and then uh after a few minutes uh, and i took a picture and after a few minutes they um said okay we're gonna get you uh going again but you know the lights are gonna stay on i'm like okay that's weird but and then it was like the scariest ride and then it was over and they were nice they said um if you guys want to go again uh because it broke down we will allow you to and And i was like nope nope Nope. (laughs) i think i was i was the only one on the ride who said no everyone else was like yeah let's go again i'm like no no i have other things i can be doing and that was scary um i don't want this anymore um, but I did have a very good time, and I stayed for the fireworks. Um, that's basically it. I went back to the hotel and decided next year I will go again. But th- but next time when I go to VidCon, I'm going to spend uh, half my time at Disney parks uh, <laughs> to to make it better, and uh, you know also try to um, not uh, feel bad 
so that I can socialize a bit more. Well, if I can uh, budget the time, maybe I'll come down and visit you next year. There you go. Um, so I haven't that heard from it. I haven't heard from mm-hmm. Austin in a while. Or is that? Oh, sorry. Are you done? Yeah, I'm, I'm basically I'm basically done. That's it. I do want to say that um, I have a, a great admiration for the woman who was the host of the Jungle Cruise, because she has to say the same corny jokes over and over again every 15 minutes, all day. Um, and I'm like, bless you, man. You know, they, I'm sorry, but that's that's live performance work. That, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, I, you know, I guess it time, is. Every time you do stage, if you're on stage for like three weeks. Every night, mm-hmm. you got to show up and do the same thing you've been doing for like four, five, six months or something like that and make it look mm-hmm. as spontaneous, as fresh as like anything. Yeah, and she has to do this like many, many times a day yeah. as opposed to like one show a night. And like – and she she did not seem to lose her enthusiasm either. either. This was at the end – this was at like towards the end of the day. The sun was going down. She had probably already done this like dozens of times. But she was like really into it and I'm like – Thank you. Thank you for, you know, making this this feel, like, uh, really cool. Now, um, now that I think about it, what they probably do is work shifts. So well, I'm sure. I'm like sure. Two she, she, hours on one ride, and then you, like, go to something else, and then you go to something else, and go to something else. Well, she's not the only one there, so I assume you're right. There are other uh, guides, but still, she has to have done these same jokes yeah. many times that day. Oh, yeah, uh, so... And, and probably – she probably doesn't switch them up and try to think of the best elephant joke the next day. Yeah. It's probably the same joke. So it's – it's uh, I, I appreciated uh, that uh, level of professionalism, I guess. Um, and uh, that's it. I could go on and, and explain how uh, adventure the Adventureland section is, is like way racist. Uh, Do you but figure? Like I, what? Do you figure? Yeah. I mean I don't really know how to say it. Except this, it's it's not so racist that it ruined my time, but it was it was just racist enough that if I went there with a black person, that black person would look at me as if to say, "Really? <laughs> at least at least once." Uh, I was alone the entire time, so I just had to soak in all all of that on my own and just deal with it. Um, I, I, less the less said about the enchanted tiki room, the better. Um, and that is it. I am done, and I feel like I've taken up a lot of time. No, so, no, no, uh, and only, Austin has been like fifteen minutes. But Leon, I gotta Aust- say, I'm really, really happy that yeah. you went to Disneyland by yourself and had oh, a phenomenal so time. It was so good. Like I like halfway through, I was thinking, I'm so glad I'm here by myself because now I can just do everything that I want. The entire time, and I'm walking around, and like, and like, like almost everyone there, it's like, it's either like a big group, and they're all trying to decide what to do, or parents and their kids, well, and they're all screaming. That's the advertising, you know, is that like you see uh, the happy two kids, and they're you know two parents, and they're all white, and they stay at a Disneyland <laughs> fucking hotel, and like fireworks go off, and then Cinderella like touches uh, the little girl on the nose, and the little girl's like, oh my god, and the boy chases Pluto around, and they're like, family packages for Disney, ranging from yeah. four pints of your blood to one of your eyeballs. Yeah. But um, I, I just I'm like not- it that you're like, nah, fuck it, I'm going alone. Like, I want to see that Disney commercial that's like, Disneyland, Bachelor? Come get it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I will say this about uh, all the families there. A lot of them had the same idea to all dress in an Incredibles t-shirt. Uh, I guess so they would be able to pick themselves out of a crowd. But I walked in and it was just like a sea of red. Everyone, they, there are lost children everywhere. I just know it. <laughs> um, I, the only other thing I'll say is I was very pleased that I found a, a power outlet uh, to help uh, recharge my phone for a, a little bit because they don't provide those. They're hidden in the park. You can either buy, kind of buy one uh, somewhere, which I was not down for doing, uh, and I didn't even know how, but, or you could like search for one. And I, I Googled it, like, where is there, are there hidden power outlets at Disneyland so I can charge my phone? And they're all like these like scavenger hunt ass um websites where it's like if you go behind the Edelweiss snack bin there's one camouflaged in the fake rock and i'm like okay whatever and then i get there and it's true (laughs) i was like okay (laughs) fuck 
Um, but yeah, that's that was my Disneyland uh, v- vacation. I, I could go on, I guess, uh, but that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, Austin, Austin, you have said literally nothing for uh, 20 minutes, and that's okay. Uh, but if you would like to say something, that's that would also be cool. Are you are you doing law in a frenzy? Because <laughs> that's something. Disney World for life. <laughs> Di- I, look, I I will probably do Disney World uh, again at some point Disney, because they have like Disney World is the only one I've been to. Yeah, they have Epcot, and I want to go back to Epcot, and I want to go back to the other thing that's there, but they keep changing the name. Do they still have uh, Universal Studios down there too? That yeah yeah that, that Universal Studios is is its own thing. Apparently, most of the rides are motion simulators. Um, I went on one motion simulator at Disneyland, which was Star Tours. I felt queasy while doing it, and I didn't like it that much. Yeah, um, they can think not, that they can do that. That was a lot. Um, it's weird because none of none of the other rides, which jostled me around quite a bit, did that. But uh, that I don't know. Maybe it was like the um, vision of me flying around Alderaan or whatever, um, and the motion made it hard. It's the um, same. It's the same reason why people get sick in VR. Is because yes. what your eyes are telling you yeah. is that you are moving forward at possibly incredible speeds, but what your body mm-hmm. is telling you is, I'm sitting still, and your brain goes, nah, 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 nah. We must be sick. <laughs> yeah. Um. So Austin. that is... Yeah, Austin, please. Me? Yeah. Yeah. You got yeah, go about me. 70 million things to talk about. I have two. Oh my gosh! I have a million. Um, well, let's start with a thing maybe that we've all we've all partaken in, which is Voltron. Oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Leon, have you caught up too? Oh yes, right away. Uh, um, do we need spoiler alert? Because we it stuff happens. Every yeah yeah every everyone like um if you don't want to hear about Voltron, just go ahead if, uh, a few minutes or something like. But you should have watched Voltron by now. <laughs> is what? Yeah, I'm sorry. You really well, why do you? What are you even doing? Um, yeah, go ahead, Austin. Oh, it's just, so the last couple of quote-unquote seasons, which have really been like half seasons <laughs> uh, that they're yeah. releasing in pretty quick succession, have been a lot of setup and a lot of shuffling things around. And we've discussed before how the show starts off really strong, but the last couple of seasons have been uh, not bad, but lesser than that really strong start. But with mm-hmm. this new season, uh, all that setup is finally paying off in oh, a very big so way. so much payoff. It's basically nothing but payoff. It's yeah. an entire season of payoff. Except for except for the um the game episode. Yeah, there's a, okay, yeah. Even then, <laughs> even then, I'm not like I'm not slagging it, right? Mm-hmm. No. I'm it just, was I'm it was good. It has like nothing to do with almost anything, but it is right. so charming. It's like yeah, a, here's a the thing, fly here's... episode of Breaking Bad where it's like I know we're doing this other thing, but let's just take a minute to do something else. Yeah. I when when uh, the D and D episode of um, of Voltron started, I thought I didn't understand exactly what was happening. So I thought, oh, this is going to be like some sort of non canon episode where we see all these characters in a fantasy setting, and then literally nothing else will happen. And then like little, there are little hints that they're playing like that. This is a game, and then that's what it is. I literally um, do so- it immediately. <laughs> I, I I that that is not what I uh, assumed. I assumed that this was like. Um, I forget. I'm trying to think of an example of this, but every this once in a while, this is such a trope, there's... though, Leon. Like D and D is so hot right now because of things like yeah. Critical Role and the Adventure Zone, and it's just mm. like every show has a D and D episode and a now. Little show we know called Dice Funk. Never heard yeah, of but it. But I, I, I don't <laughs> watch a I don't watch a lot of shows that would do this, except mm-hmm. like Community, I guess. Yeah, I was out, back, I was but... literally about to say I think it started with Community, but also Gravity Falls had I think probably one of the best ones. In any case, I, I'm with Austin. I kind of knew it right away, only because of the language that they spoke. Mm-hmm. Um, like, if you if you grew up during the 80s and 90s when video games were becoming a common thing, you'll know that, like, everybody was always in a rush to write that video game episode or, like, you know, that episode. And it still happens today. Um, but... It was always like, hang on, I have to get to the next level in, like, 1995. And by then it was like, uh, no, that's not, like, how it works anymore. 
literally the most extreme example of that in the history of art is in the film Jarhead, where someone mm-hmm. mentions when you get to the ninth level in Metroid, it starts over, and not a single word in that sentence is correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I was, I was, I'm always really refreshed to see people who grew up with this being a little bit more socially acceptable and, and aren't like, that's weird, writing episodes for like TV shows and things like that and being like, hey, guess what one of my first creative experiences was? It was playing a tabletop role-playing game. And you can almost, almost recognize the language that people use when someone's like, ah, I'm going to use the staff of blah. And it's like the, the function of the staff is in its name where it's like, mm-hmm. I'm going to use the staff of levitation. And it's like, yeah, that person has played Dungeons and Dragons before, probably second edition. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's part of the lexicon. Like half of video games are built on D and D mechanically. And all of D and D is basically built on, Lord of the Rings and Norse mythology, mainly. Yeah, there's there's not a lot of subtlety in in early Dungeons and Dragons, though. Is the thing, and we're we're coming to an age where the people who grew up with it, and that's like their that's their their primogenital, I don't know, <laughs> template. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a, it's like a foundation upon which most other nerd cult- culture is built. So it's a shared language, which is mm-hmm. why even though people ask us to play other shows on Dice Funk, it's like you'll have to relearn a new not relearn, you'll have to learn a whole new language to interact with it. It's yeah. just like we don't have that uh, you know, investment already, so it's yeah, just there's, it's there's just a hard that, switch. That common tongue, if you will. Um, but yeah, as far as Voltron goes, actually, I don't even think we need to spoil anything to really discuss it. I think it was really good. They paid off a lot of things and some in really exciting ways I didn't expect exactly. And I don't really have any major complaints about it. It was yeah. amazing. Mm. Yeah. Worth it. I wonder if they had released, uh, them in like big full seasons instead of the couple weird half ones, if I'd feel differently, if it was just the format and not the content or what, who knows? I was thinking about that. And I kind of realized that I sort of liked the fact that they were giving me more Voltron at, like, regular intervals as opposed to having to wait a long time and then just dropping, like, a shit heap of Voltron on me. So, like, you know, because six episodes, Voltron, I don't, I don't even remember the episodes, like, tally at 30 minutes. I think they, they get edited down to, like, commercial TV half hour, so they're, like, 22, 24 minutes long. You can get through, like, six episodes of Voltron in a night like a movie. Mm-hmm. So, like, the new season of Voltron drops, and you can just be like, I'm watching Voltron, and be done in a night, you know? So it satisfies that kind of binge-watching, but then at the same time, you're not waiting so long for the next act. Mm. Oh, and another another really big influence, a driver on the whole D and D in popular culture thing is Stranger Things. I've forgotten, but yeah. that's a lot of oh, yeah. normies who really only watched Netflix uh, suddenly were introduced to it. So, um, that's a thing. I um, was there. Yeah. Other thing, I don't know if everyone wants to talk about this, but Luke Cage season two on watched Netflix. It. Hell yeah! Leon what do you think, Johnny? Care. Yeah. I, Fuck you, Leon. <laughs> Go back to Disneyland, traitor. Yes. Sorry. I just I I watched like three seasons of like that Marvel stuff on Netflix. Like the first season of Daredevil, half the second season, part of the season of Jessica Jones. I'm like, yeah, this isn't me. Uh, I I don't need to invest myself in another aspect of this cinematic universe. Yeah. Uh, don't worry about it. We're we're familiar with the Leon philosophy. Like, I'll give you a little chance, but then yeah. if you don't. If you don't reach me, fuck mm-hmm. it. Leon does mm-hmm. the Roman Emperor thumbs down and the lions <laughs> descend. Yep. All right, so Austin, let's talk Luke Cage yeah. season two. Yeah, so I think we were both pretty on the same wavelength as far as Luke Cage season one goes, which is yep. that we liked it a lot, but we felt it had a really strong start that uh, petered off when they switched gears halfway through. And I think yeah, even the changed, showrunners changed the villain. Like mm-hmm. it got messy. 
the the people who made the show agree, I believe, in interviews and stuff. I don't have quotes in front of me, but I feel like I read that somewhere where they were like, yeah, we probably could have handled that better. Uh, season two uh, kind of comes out strong yet again with this new villain who has a really, really great introduction. It, it, like in the first episode, stabs someone in one eye and then drags the knife across through their other eye. And it's just so fucking heinous. I was like, holy shit. It ruled. I was just, I was bought in immediately to Bushmaster, the new villain, yeah. and he, a super big highlight. Um, a lot of the show has to do with uh, Jamaican and Jamaican American. I, I don't want to say culture because it's mostly just gang culture. Um, the 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 yardies, I guess. I believe that's their British term for it. They they go into it like they're like, oh no, they're called the Stylers now. I don't know how accurate any of that is, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some ways, like Luke Cage was like the African American experience. Black Panther was just Africa, no American. And uh, Luke Cage season two is Jamaican and Jamaican American. And it's you know exploitation and the response to that. It it almost has like a direct it's, there's Black there's Panther more parallel. there's more colonization involved, but a different kind. Yeah, I can definitely have people saying like, oh, it's like Killmonger and, and the villain has a point about how the people have been treated, and, but he goes too far in his revenge. Like it's it's a pretty clear line, but there's some wrinkles in it that are really interesting. Um, I have to say for my purposes, I was extremely excited to see, uh, I believe it's pronounced Obeya. Um, my, my American mouth probably failed us there, but the uh, Jamaican religious practices uh, portrayed um i've literally never seen that in fiction before and i was super jazzed um for those who don't know uh when the american you know and i guess south american slave trade brought a lot of africans over and africans are a very diverse group of people with dozens if not hundreds of different religions yeah and it's it's even it's even a little offensive to say oh he's african if you're talking about someone's culture, but the thing is, is all these things, all this kidnapping, this slavery, they didn't care. So it's like it's like trying to track down one particular peanut in a whole bunch of peanuts, which is just like I mean, it's a terrible, it's a terrible analogy. But like the point it is, it really is, that is the British. <laughs> no, the British Empire. I'm saying they cared about these peoples and their distinctions less than they cared about just being like, well, it's a peanut, whatever. Well, the the distinction that's important here is, say, the British uh, slave trade led to what is now like the Southern Baptist Church in America. Mm -hmm. But the Spanish slave trade and the slave colonies in the Caribbean led to the synchronization of Catholicism, not Protestantism, with African religions. So what you'll get is in like Cuba and Puerto Rico, you get Santeria, which is an incredibly interesting uh, belief system. I don't know if you would even call it a full – I mean – the, what exactly the terms apply to is kind of murky because there aren't like holy texts, right? It's just kind of practices, but we'll call it a religion for our purposes. And in Jamaica and other places, but very specifically in, as far as Luke Cage goes, you get Obeya, which is the, the, what they're, what's shown in Luke Cage and I have never seen portrayed on screen before. And it is basically a plot excuse for the bad guy to have superpowers. Like they don't go into like, here's what we're doing. We're venerating saints. We're using these herbs for their, you know – out, like the the spiritual enlightenment yeah. or whatever they don't really yeah. get into it and maybe I, maybe somebody was like hey nobody's gonna know <laughs> yeah i'd be interested in getting the perspective of, of like actual practitioners on the way it's portrayed because i bet it's a pretty surface level and like not nuanced or anything I, yeah. and like obviously we need better but like it's a good start starting point for that but that was what jumped out to me is extremely exciting about this season just off the bat that's like the first thing that comes to mind here yeah yeah um as far as like the luke cage part of it um he is actually kind of a bit player in a really ensemble story black mariah is the name of a character who is really the focus of the plot and character development Mm -hmm. and her family and um the people around her and luke cage is just kind of like a character who is there they spend a lot of time with misty knight too yeah, she basically has like a sub show in the show, and Luke Cage kind of shows up to punch people every once in a while. There's also like a uh, uh, Luke Cage, not Luke Cage. Uh, what's that's the main guy? What's the uh, Iron Fist? Iron yeah. Fist. Danny uh, Rand shows up for an episode. Yep, and um, the Claire. And is they in have there for a while. they have fun. Yeah, I want to because I want to say this. Like one of the things I really I was really worried about because Luke Cage and Iron Fist are supposed to be like best buds, mm-hmm. you know. Like, they, in in the Marvel comic universe, they're best friends. 
And I was I was really concerned when I saw the first Iron Fist. I was like, eh, is that guy really going to be Luke Cage's best friend? But yeah. then, like, seeing them together for an episode, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I got it. They work towards it. Yeah, they're putting in some work. And it's actually, it's almost like a more effective Defenders in the Defenders show, which... <laughs> I kind of dislike more with every passing Marvel thing because it's yeah. just like it's such a nothing. Like none of the characters have any chemistry. They don't even like each other. It's just them fighting faceless ninjas. I kind of I'm more upset about it than I was when I first watched it. But yeah, th- this show is not There's that. A, and I oh, fuck. I hate using that word. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, but yeah, I, I think we. I think Luke Cage 2 is the best season of Luke Cage and one of the best seasons of any Marvel Netflix stuff. Maybe only second to Jessica Jones season one. I I, I go Daredevil season one, Jessica Jones season one, Luke Cage season two. Those are my top mm-hmm. three right now. Yeah. I think for me, uh, like obviously the choreography, the, the fighting in Daredevil is untouchable, but it's not really about anything the way that jessica jones and luke cage are about things i just i like i love vincent d'onofrio's kingpin Mm. too much yeah his performance really is very strong it just Um, yeah yeah that's like and i mean i'm not saying that like david tennant didn't blow it or (laughs) i don't i don't know any of the actors in in luke cage 2 by name um yeah but i'm not saying that they screwed up either they're all very very good antagonists you know but yeah, Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin just because he held the whole season together and he had such an arc and we got like a whole episode about his upbringing and things like that. And it was just like it was so it it, it pulled me in. And that's that's really the reason why I rank uh, Daredevil season one above Jessica Jones, because I think Jessica Jones season one had stronger themes and better character development than than the first Daredevil. Uh, speaking of character development, uh, to close this out, it's interesting what they choose to do with Luke Cage's character development because he only gets some at the kind of the beginning and end of the season. And I, I wonder if it's going to be controversial what they choose to do. Um, I feel like it could have been uh, a, like a stronger through line throughout the middle of the season where we, we kind of lose it. I, you know, I, I didn't – there was – because there was a point in there where I saw a frustrated man who was – pretty much invincible you know but he's not superman right he can't fly places he can't shoot lasers out of his eyes like his superpower is you can try and shoot and stab him and it doesn't work and he's so dense he can like punch your guts out in one go (laughs) and there's like you know it, it must be kind of weirdly frustrating to be like almost superman Mm Hmm. you know and that's I saw a lot of that in the later third of the season, where it was like he was he basically was saying, you know, I can only punch so many people. I can't be everywhere. I can't shield everyone. You know, like I I can't do all of this. Yeah, and his his frustrations. I don't want to say they're unearned because they do lay the groundwork. Like the very beginning of the show and the end of it are about it. So like they do the they put in the work. It's just I feel like they lose that in the middle of the season somewhat, and it becomes really just about Black Mariah and Bushmaster, which is fine. They do amazing work, but yeah. I it, it's not it's not a full on Luke Cage story. You're, and you're right that he's kind of a bit player. He serves as a bookend almost, or bookends. I guess it would be. Like, there's a lot about him in the first when they're, like, mm-hmm. you know, introducing everybody as they currently are. And there's a lot in the end when weird alliances start forming. But it was it was definitely one of the better Marvel Netflix TV shows. And it's also interesting the way in that it is so very 2018. Like, people get called Trump at multiple points. People say things like, make Harlem great again. And it's like... They're just in it, and yeah. it's hard. Like, when it, when that started, it felt corny. Like, I, I think the first Luke Cage, and both of them, the first more so, was a little corny at times with this message, um, which is fine. That's I, I actually like corniness. But, uh, in, but this time, it actually feels, like, more dark and ominous. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's the performances or what, but there's just, like, this real sense of, like, everyone knows shit's fucked up, yeah. right? It's like it's not even funny. It's just bad. Yeah. I and you. 
if it's just for like a Disney product, right? You think they want to be like, if they're going to be political, they take like safe political positions, like racism is bad, which is what like season <laughs> one was like, yeah, no one's going to just, dis- nobody you want to, in your life is going to disagree with that. But here they just come out and mm. say like some stuff. So I don't know. I liked it a lot. Um, a lot, a lot of interesting uh, performances and ideas in there, and I'm excited for season three or whatever was, comes next for him. I was really glad that they brought back how important music was to the first mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Like, I worried, I worried that people complaining about the first season of Luke Cage being derailed and things like that, that they were going to be like, oh, okay, we better tighten it up, make it more story-focused, you know, like, get a better plot arc. But it was still like, ladies and gentlemen, KRS-One! I was like, yay! Yeah, there's nothing quite as strong as the Jadena scene from the first season, which is like one of the all time best scenes, just like from television in general. Um, but they, there's some there's some knockouts. Um, Leon, you can come back into the yep. room. We can take off your earmuffs. Cool. Um, OK, I just wanted to say real quick mm-hmm. that Santeria is also a really bad song by a shitty band called Sublime. I was I was wondering if I was gonna have to get into that with you. And <laughs> I was just waiting. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I'm done now. Uh, that's it. I'm right. Anyway. Um. I I don't I, I don't have the energy to fight you on Sublime tonight. This, uh, yeah, we're good. Um. Anything else you guys want to say? Oh, oh gosh, there's, there's so plenty much. more. We're only we're only at forty minutes of recording here, man. That's true. <laughs> Leon's um, like, I got to get back to my business. Awesome. Uh, it's fine. What else you got? What else do I got? I watched yeah. a movie. Uh, so this is mm. a very Leon topic. Just movies okay. in general. Uh, the movie sure. was called I, Tanya. Okay. That was good. I like that one. You have seen it? Have you talked about it with the internet yet? Not much. Um, I don't really like biopics, but uh, uh, someone... How was that word? Uh, you know, the the right way. <laughs> okay. um, the Literally the only way anyone should say it. Uh, I, I, I don't normally like biopics, but uh, they made this one not in the formula of a biopic where they kind of like switch it up and like, it's like half fake documentary, half um, uh, drama. And also there's like sort of like a, a stylized um, like cuts where they're, where uh, like Tanya, they'll, they'll show Tanya doing something that she may or may not have done. And then she looks at the camera every once in a while. And it's like, this did not happen. And then she shoots someone or something. Um, and so, so there, there was enough style to it where it didn't feel like I was just watching something that I may as well have read, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so yeah, I did like it. Um, I thought the performances were solid and um it for for me like i i you know i grew up and that was like a scandal when i was young but i didn't follow it at all i was like, three I, yeah when it happened so i, I didn't really I, I was i was obviously uh older because i'm i'm older but so that I, checks well, out i ran I the had math to do a school project on the olympics that year jesus <laughs> Okay, so there's there's varying degrees to how we how involved we were I with this. I got so fucking sick and tired of that shit. I'm I mean, not sure I even want to see the movie. It's yeah, weird I, though because the, the zany madcap editing and humor of the thing is kind of covering up the fact that it's a pretty simple story in which she did not really participate. Like, yeah. the Tanya Harding she, scandal is, like, some guy hit some other lady on the knee with a baton, and it didn't really and, affect her career. If anything, it, it helped her, made her more successful and famous, and the the person everyone blames only maybe kind of knew about it, and that's well, it. you know, it must have been the yeah. woman. <laughs> yeah. Is she, how, how, how involved she, she is is sort of, like, um, made vague in the movie and is still vague in reality. Like we don't know exactly how involved she was. She may have not. She may have known Jack Squat. She may have ordered the hit with like fire in her eyes. But like the truth is probably somewhere in between. All I'm saying, I don't. All right, is that yeah. I very reluctantly listened to Sufjan Stevens' Tanya Harding <laughs> song. Uh huh. Okay. And I loved it. And so, th- okay. that song really does take her side and the movie does too it portrays her as basically a victim of abuse and that they warped her personality and i mean it's so this is going to be a very austin just about analysis. any professional athlete you're talking about austin well i want to say specifically this movie is really about class right because yeah. she is yeah. poor and her 
skating rival is less so. And it basically is like, oh, she comes from this broken house of uh, poor people and the anger at their situation makes them abusive. And that abuse makes the people who get abused abusive. And the cops don't help. And men get away with shit. And it's just like, it, it is very much like here's Austin on the soapbox again. You guys want to talk about income inequality and professional <laughs> skating? Uh, but oh my. it is, it's like that. The, it's the most, the most important uh, field of income inequality that we could probably be talking about at this point in time. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> so look, uh, so yeah, I, um, I, 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 I like the movie. I thought it was, uh, pretty good. It's not like one of my favorite movies of that year or anything. Um, but it, it, it made me, I cared what happened to her because I legitimately knew, knew nothing except like the memes about it and like the SNL sort of version of what happened. Um, I, and I'm, and, and the, the movie for all, for all I know, like obscure some things, but just just the actual facts of like who did what and who got busted for what like I just didn't know going in. I mean, it, it, you you would think I would, but it's just it a figure skating scandal from when I was like nine is just not something that stuck with me. Okay, Leon, um, I'll watch it. Fine, <laughs> but the, <laughs> the movie kind of posits that it doesn't matter. Like the perp, the point of the movie kind of is that like the media requires a narrative and that people yeah. kind of fall into roles. Like the movie kind of ends with, you know, the as the story of the the you know scandal is coming to a close. Someone turns the TV on and it's OJ Simpson getting ready for his trial. It's like, well, yeah. now it's time for the next media narrative. The, it's just the like, magical public usage of the word allegedly. <laughs> yeah, the well, you um, don't you the, don't at the end of it, like you know three weeks later you don't have to come back and be like nope you can just be like yeah the, they didn't think so but allegedly yeah there's a scene in the movie where we cut to like a, a dramatization of um, Tanya Harding like literally beating up uh, Nancy Kerrigan with like a steel pipe and then she looks looks over her shoulder and says some people think this is what happened and I'm gonna be honest I know do so little about what happened <laughs> if that if the movie revealed like yeah she was the one who did like oh okay I, I heard that in comedy once um that that yeah so like she's she, the movie makes a good point if unless you're actually paying attention to this you're probably going to get a completely different picture of this in your head um admittedly again i was a child but I, I, there, Google exists. I could have just looked this up. But that kind of it does wrap um, around to the obliteration of truth in our society. <laughs> I, not that the the world is perfectly truthful until conservatives came to power. Like obviously that's garbage. But just the way that like the media and stuff uh, is hyper. I, what's the like hyper reality we call it, where like everything feels exposure, like exposure. Exposure has reduced the value of truth. Mm. It, it's it's also just like everything feels so much more disposable right so like that's, this was the that's biggest what i mean by that's what i mean by the reduction of value in in truth yeah. like you don't need to know anything anymore you can just look it up and it doesn't matter where you get it from i mean it's on the internet so it must be reputable but i mean if this happened today it would not make it into the algorithm i don't think or if it did it'd be like only in small circles and people wouldn't be talking about it within hours it's just like know. how people fast still it... think lance armstrong is innocent you know <laughs> and we, we talked before about how people don't even know the Mueller, uh you know probe has produced all these indictments and stuff people know right. what they want to know or what they're told to know and it's like this whole thing anyway that's a dark road but the movie is actually, I think, much more interesting in that respect than it is as a story of somebody's life who has just, like, had some shitty things happen to them and then may or may not have been mildly shitty. I mean, not that, like, hitting someone with a baton sucks. Like, I'm not trying to downplay that. But <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's not. I Like, my image of it was much worse. Like, she was out for, like, a couple months and then came back and beat tanya at the next competition. Like, it did not hurt her career. If anything, it extremely, extremely raised her profile. So... Um, yeah, she's fine. She he ended up winning a, a silver medal uh, at, at at Olympics, um, which I know it's not like what you want, but it's still pretty good. Uh, yeah, another so... thing with the, why they have to make it so fucking uh, high jinks laden is because it doesn't really contain 
traditional climaxes like a, a story you want like she tanya didn't win any big events she didn't she had like one moment where she did a cool not, move not late in her life i mean i don't think she ever won a gold at like the olympics like she no no that's that's what i'm saying is that like you know i'm saying when she was young when she was up and coming and things like that people were like whoa hey yeah, I'm just. If it was fiction, though, she would have gotten like silver, and Kerrigan would have got gold or something, right? Like they would have been like a very close or like a crushing defeat. Instead, she was just like, okay, and it was it just kind of ended. I don't know. It's just something I think yeah. about about how often uh, fiction has to like make everything extreme, but like mm-hmm. in our in our present reality, everything's so extreme that I don't know how much further we can go. Just we so talked- we're clear. Yeah. This story ends in the three of us in like a a big three way kiss. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking about that now. Um Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Leon. Did you did you play Zelda, Leon? <laughs> no, I'm still playing Mario. I beat it, but now there's other things mm-hmm. and I'm playing the other things. Are they How better it? other things? Do you feel better about the game now? Uh, I, I I still like it. It is good. Um, I really liked that I got to be Bowser at the very end. Spoilers. Very good at, yeah, deal with it, I guess. I don't, sorry. <laughs> Spoilers for a video game. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's just a shitty way to phrase that. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, but yeah, I got to be Bowser and it was fun. And then uh, now, I, and I was like, okay, that was good. I can probably stop now. And then it lands me in the Mushroom Kingdom that looks exactly like Mario 64. Okay, like, well, that's play the it. other big spoiler. Just yeah, it's like, okay, well, now I'm definitely playing that. Um, so now I'm playing that, and, uh, like, um, it's good, and I, I enjoy it quite a bit. I, uh, so I'm going to keep playing. The, the game says, you need more moons. And I'm like, okay, uh, we'll find out what I get when I get more moons now, because I'm definitely getting them. Um, I want them now. So, yeah, the game is good in that it is keeping me playing even though the credits rolled and Mario thanked me for playing. That usually means I'm done, but apparently I'm, I'm not. Ugh, he's very such um, a completionist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> this is the first game in like a million years that I'm still playing after the game tells me I can stop, technically. Um, so that's fun, I guess. Uh, um, yeah? Yeah, that's basically... <laughs> I mean, I, I I could talk about like some movies I've seen, I guess, but like nothing really jumps out. I while I was um on my trip, uh, on on the way there, uh, I I I just rewatched The Goonies because it was available on on the back of someone's seat. Hell yeah! Uh, the TV. I don't want to watch a new movie I've never seen on an airplane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's that's just not cool for me. But I will that watch was, a movie I've seen. That was honestly that was the first time I saw Ryan Johnson's Brick. Oh, it's a very good movie yeah, it and was. a very bad way to see it. Well, the thing the thing was, I was not relaxed because I was flying home from Scotland because my father was in the hospital in a chemically mm. induced coma. Yeah, and I was like, I need something to focus on. Yeah. So I watched Brick, and it served really well. Uh, Brick is a great movie. Um, it also, and, you, and the- I think you can watch it on an airplane, like seat TV. I not mm-hmm. miss a thing because it's not like, look at the size of those dinosaurs. <laughs> that, I mean, that's that's fair. I guess it just for me like the the distraction of like being jammed up against someone else is not not for me. But um, yeah, I did that on the way there and on the way back. I watched Mean Girls for the million time, uh, which is also good which and something I, I have never seen. It's very good. Um, I keep looking for it movie. on Netflix, but it just. Never shows. Mm. Yeah. Um, the only movie that I saw while I was there, um, basically I was in a hotel room and they have like regular TV. So I was like flipping around actual channels, um, which is different. And the first Paul Blart mall cop movie was on. And uh, long time uh, viewers and listeners will know I had to do a um, Happy Madison stream where I watched a bunch of uh, of those movies. Had in a row. to? That's strong. Yeah, I it it I it was my committed attempt to. to yeah, committed to. Um and the last movie I saw on that stream was Paul Blart 2, even though I hadn't seen the original. And because it hap- it maybe it was the delirium at that point <laughs> or the or the fact that like every movie prior to it was just like gross and offensive and 
Paul Blart 2 is like, I mean, there's some like, um, not cool fat jokes, I guess, but for the most part, it's like a, a largely harmless, but bad movie. I was just really into how harmless it was. Did it, so did opposed... the first movie give you deeper lore understanding of the Paul Blart <laughs> universe? Um, the first movie is, is kind of like the second movie. Like I, I just sat there and watched it and I thought, um, that wasn't funny or good, but like I didn't hate my experience sitting here watching it as opposed to watching something that's like some of Adam Sandler's stuff that just has all this like deeply sexist and racist bullshit that just shows up in it. Whereas I get maybe and, and the thing is like he's producing this stuff, but maybe Kevin James is like less of a shitty person and since he's also has producer credits in this stuff, he's like, Maybe we can make this one less shitty. <laughs> Adam and that maybe that's what happened. I don't know. I wasn't there. But uh Paul Blart Mall Cop One is not a good movie, but it is it, it is mostly harmless. Uh and I, I appreciated that. One of my favorite um, Douglas Adams books. Yeah. I uh I try you know what? I tried reading mostly harmless recently and wasn't a fan, so uh oh well. Um anyway, I don't want to get too too far off track. Um, yeah, that's really all I've been doing. That and, like, working crazy amount uh, this month to uh, get all my episodes done on time. I still have to make five episodes a month because that is my standard. Mm-hmm. And I also was just gone for a week, which means I had to work extra hard. So uh, the the by the time this episode is released uh, over the weekend, the last episode of the month will be done. And then I can start next month's episodes, which will be um, a chore because some of them are longer than average, and I just keep putting more and more pressure on myself to get those numbers. Uh, and that is it for me. Um, anyone have any like uh, short topics we, you want to do right before we hit um, questions? Johnny, do you have things? But I do. I do have a, have a couple of things. Ooh, but I, like, thing. Is there anything that you're burning to talk about? I'm always burning, Johnny. I can't, All right. I can't dull my shine for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I got to talk about, um, very briefly, a, a Netflix sh- um, stand-up comedy show okay. that I think everybody should watch. Um, I, like, I can't talk about the content. It's really something that you have to see because it's, a, it's an amazing journey about someone who was just... All right, so it's called it's called Nanette, and it's by a Tasmanian stand-up comedian who I guess is uh, conceivably Australian. I don't know if there's like a big problem there, but she was born in Tasmania, who okay. grew up in a very religious section of Tasmania, and like in her teenage years, she understood that she was a lesbian, but like mm-hmm. in 1997, I think it was, Tasmania was like. I guess it's legal to be a homosexual. Um, and, and it's, it is, in the first place, it's very funny. But then, at a certain point in time, it becomes just, it's so brave. Mm and so honest and so compassionate and so painful. Like at one point in time in the show, it just stops being stand-up comedy. It just, Mm. it just stops. And she starts talking about her life and how, you know, like the only way she was able to deal with certain things was to go into comedy. Hmm. And it is just, it's, it's an hour and nine minutes long. Again, it's called Nanette. That's N-A-N-E-T-T-E. Oh, I found it. Okay. Everybody should watch this. Okay. Like, everybody. Even if you don't like stand-up comedy, watch it. Because at the same time, it's such an incredibly funny piece of work, and it's also, I think, one of the most important dramatic pieces I've ever seen this year. Maybe, maybe not even this year. Maybe in like the last decade. Well, well, I have an hour after we're done this, but before I have to do stuff, so that's what I'm doing. Watch now. it. I'm just gonna I'm absolutely gonna, I just watch it, it, and after you're done, message me and let me know what you think. 
Okay. Because it just, like, at certain times it just had me giggling in fits, and at mm-hmm. other times I, I just, I was speechless. Mm. All right. The other thing I wanted to talk about is I got a second medication. Oh, good. I'm on two medications now. Yeah. <laughs> We, they, we call him Two Medication Johnny. Yep, Two Medication Johnny. This is best Johnny. Three Medication Johnny? <laughs> nah, man. I'll take over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm on I'm on Wellbutrin now. Mm. What's that? Um, apparently, it's like, it's my doctor says it's it's something that they prescribe to people to, like, ease the edge off quitting smoking. Oh. I was like, really? He was like, yeah, for some reason it really works with that. <laughs> um, okay. So I was having problems with my SSRI. And he was like, okay, take this too. Because they work together. They don't do the same thing. There's going to be no banter between the two of them. You know, they just, they do their thing. They smell like aniseed. He didn't say that. I'm telling you that. It smells like aniseed, which is kind of like cool because you open the bottle and it's like, that smells kind of fresh and good. And then you put one in your mouth and you're like, that tastes horrible. Um, but yeah, so I'm on that now. And that like has given me other kind of weird tremors, like like muscle tremors, like not being able to engage my muscles properly. It's, it's a little better now than it was because I got it last week. Last week, if we podcasted, you would have heard weird things. Like, it was in my vocal cords. Like, it would have sounded like I was vibratoing for the whole podcast or something like that. And yeah, it has also affected my ability to, like, <clears throat> engage in bowel movements properly. Nice. And that's, I like hearing this. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Um, Questions? We're... we're... Yeah, we're an hour in. We should probably do questions, right? <laughs> probably. Um, I mean, we don't have to if you don't want to, but like that is our tradition, isn't it? I Some mean, traditions Austin, are made to be broken. Austin, okay, I guess. If yeah. you're, I'm serious. Like, if you're some kind of like weird black hole that is just siphoning off a supernova or something like that, which is apparently a thing that happened really recently, that astronomers are like, "Holy shit! Look at that!" Um, talk to me, buddy. I didn't follow that at all. Do you want me to ask the first question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that too. Also, there's uh, fireworks in my background, so if you hear noises, that's what's happening. Um, I just that, assumed okay. it was shooting. <laughs> yeah, that's a safe assumption uh, in Florida. Um, let's see. First question from at Ingdammit on Twitter. Um, from <laughs> from a legal point of view, should we just start screaming and never stop? Because, oh God, everything is broken and will never get better. What do you guys think, legally speaking? Uh, I think, legally speaking, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg better hang the fuck on. <laughs> yeah, I, we got a bunch of questions about politics. I don't know if we can go into it, because we've talked about it pretty incessantly, the importance of the Supreme yeah. Court and the yeah. failure of Obama slash the shittiness of McConnell, and the whole thing's just jammed up, and like we can go through every opinion that's issued. There was a one on unions, there was the one... On the uh, travel ban, there's the one on the you know detention camps and stuff. Like it's just, everything's bad and it's gonna get worse. And at a certain point, like just assume it's all bad, right? Yeah, assume that it's bad, and also that um, we assume that you know exactly how we feel at this point about it. It's not that I want to deflect. It's just that um, there is a lot every week. Uh, as it turns out, uh, we have. It, it, it there's a lot of terrible things that happen in the morning, and then a lot of terrible <laughs> things that happen in the afternoon. And I'm and I, I'm and not a lot one of those in between, who, frankly. And I'm not one of those people who who's like, oh well, fuck it, everything's bad. Um, no, I'm you know I'm the opposite of that. I just don't know. I just funnel all of that rage 
uh, in, into my videos mostly. Um, and I mean, I am reading the opinions. I can tell you how the new uh, Hawaii versus Trump uh, doesn't quite overturn Korematsu. Do you guys want to hear that? I assume not. It's just like, oh, it's bad. Yeah, I get it. I, re- I read uh, or, or, or heard a, a reading of uh, Sotomayor's uh, dissent. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I liked that. That was like one good part. The one good part of this was her dragging other people. But beside, but it wasn't worth it. Um, so it was... Uh, it's it's been a rough um it's been a rough few days. I will say uh this. Um I saw a couple people on my timeline say something like, um, you know, I just wanna stop being angry. You know, I just wanna stop being angry at all this. Can I just stop being angry? Uh counterpoint, get angry. Um you know, we we're we're kinda gonna need that passion uh going into the election. Uh I really hate apathy right now. Uh, I want to be really, really clear that that's not a thing that I want people to have. If you're not angry, I... you're okay with this. If you're okay yeah, if with you're... this, you're basically de facto on their side. Yeah. Um, the most embarrassing thing that's happened this week, uh, besides all the terrible things, is just like the discourse where people are saying like hashtag civility. <laughs> um, let me let me tell you something, motherfuckers. Um, you can't create an ideology around offending people and then clutch your pearls when people are angry that they're be- by being offended. Okay, you can't swing your arms around hitting people <laughs> and then when and then when they push you back, scream bloody murder. You know what you're fucking doing, and it's transparent. And I am not as dumb as you. So yeah, there's, the there's that there's an old joke that. that I saw on Twitter today that was like a Nazi firing squad is about to shoot two dead men, or you know uh-huh. not two dead men but two men who are slated for death, and yeah. the, the Nazi commander is like, any last words? And the first guy goes, "Fuck the Nazis," and the second guy goes, "Murray, don't cause any trouble." <laughs> that is um frightening in its accuracy about the discourse right now. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could go on, and believe me, I'm gonna, because I got a lot of shit <laughs> that I'm going to incorporate into my videos next month. Um, <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna, I, I, I'm it, I'm it, I don't give a fuck mode anymore, and now I'm just, like, putting, like, all of my, um, angriest, uh, and, and, and most radical opinions, uh, out there into the world. I don't care. Um, I, I, I don't care. I, I, it's not that I don't care. I don't care about, um, offending, like, right-leaning people right now. I'm sorry, but, like, y- you need to, to realize what the fuck is going on. Um, I can't, I can't coddle you. Um, sorry, I'm being a dick. Uh, but I can't help it. Um, earlier today I said Mitch McConnell looks like a dehydrated summer camp pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> the what? thing is, and it made me fuck. Feel- he looks wet all the time. I was like, He's I was very like that's kissing. fair, except he always looks wet. <laughs> He's drenched in evil. Um, okay, so uh, that's, yeah, I, I mean, uh, that's how I feel. Um, expect more um, coherent thoughts uh, later uh, in the coming weeks when I actually have a chance to, like, write them down, as opposed to just, like, spewing um, my uh, disgust with uh, both di- the discourse and those perpetuating it um and that's and that's obviously the, the mm, okay done and the thing is there's yeah. just like so many layers to the discourse like to even make a point you have to explain like the hundred uh, other points that bring you to that like point does that make sense because yeah. it's like nobody's acting in good faith and everyone's referring right. to a, a referent that's referring to a policy that's a dog whistle to a secret dark money policy it's like all there's just so much yeah i'm not going to be screaming much louder Mm -hmm. uh, because canada while still having its problems like treating our indigenous people um like shit and not supporting them properly um i i have found a canadian whiskey now that i can buy at (laughs) affordable prices after the tariffs go up so (laughs) i'm sorry bourbon but we're just gonna have to part ways until later um and also the other week canada became the first g7 country to federally legalize cannabis mm. uh yeah. and that's going to be hitting streets in september so 420 blaze it 
Yeah, apparently that just kind of happened and it wasn't a big deal. Yeah, how's, um, how's the 21st can- century, Johnny? Because it we're sliding in the other direction. Promise. He was like, we're going to do this. And everybody was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. And then he, he submitted it. Like, the way Canadian laws get, get made is different uh, to American laws. But he submitted it to, yes, there's a Canadian Senate. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous and stupid. Um, well, I mean, you guys have – it's the Ottawa senators, so one assumes. Well, but no, the problem is that Canadian senators <laughs> okay. get appointed for life. Oof. Wow. Oh, that's a lot. So it's like it's like, <laughs> it's like the Supreme Court except bigger. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. That's that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, like we have to deal with like seven of people who are just kind of like stuck there until either they get a wild hair up their ass and decide to retire yeah. or they just keel over. Now, I don't even um, – let me, let me just quickly check here. The Canadian Senate uh, currently seats 105 people. Jesus. Yeah, who are all appointed for life. Yeah, and I, I mean, I have a problem with the fact that there are no term limits in our House of Representatives and in our Senate, mm-hmm. um, like on its own. But the idea that you're just in and that's it, um, and you don't even have to deal with re-election and whatnot, yeah. is uh, not, not. I didn't even know that, to be honest with you. Yeah. So um, the House, um, which is which is called like the House of Commons, which is basically where the Prime Minister services, which is where all Canada basically gets governed, has to submit a law to the Canadian Senate. Uh, which is called, like, the Upper House. And then the Canadian Senate goes, nah, that's fucking bonkers. Or, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. So they were like, hey, 420 blaze it. And the Senate was like, okay. <laughs> um, it's it's like, and then after that, we just need to get it, like, royally ratified, where Queen, Queen Elizabeth basically just has to say, oh, it's the will of the people. Fine. And, like, that's only happened once in Canadian history where she said, no fucking way, or the king or whatever, in, like, 1707. I can't even remember what it was. But, yeah, it's basically, like, if you know British parliamentary, it's, like, the difference between British Parliament and the House of Lords. We just call it the Senate of Canada. Love Canada. Um, actually, before we get off the topic of politics, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything depressing. Um, I just want to say I have been listening to a podcast uh, called Revolutions, which is a okay. educational podcast where like every season goes through different revolutions throughout history. So like every episode is like a new event, basically. And oh, which the... one's the best one? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so far, I've listened to the French Revolution, um, the, one of the English revolutions, actually uh, the Paris Commune. Um, there is – I'm trying to think what else. They're, they're going to do the Mexican Revolution next. It's it's not really funny. There's a couple like uh, like little jokes here and there. But really, it's Austin? Just a a yeah. podcast about revolutions isn't that funny? Listen, there are plenty of comedy history podcasts. I think those are literally all the most popular ones. Um, it's a mostly straight up okay. podcast about history, but um, an interesting pattern that has emerged throughout it is almost all of the successful revolutions in history have been where things get so, so bad. They just get worse and worse and worse until violence explodes. Mm-hmm. Basically, anytime someone tries to plan a thoughtful uh, like logical, t- you know, logical fallacies. Here's where all your hypocrisy is. Look, I proved you wrong with logic and facts. <laughs> Those people die. They get hung and guillotined and shot. Uh, and when people get really fucking pissed off and thousands of them to the, take to the streets and they kick the doors down and they drag the people out and set them on fire and hang them from lampposts, they win. Yep. Throughout history, over and over and over, forever and ever, mm-hmm. amen including, for example, the American Revolution, where uh, we just we just killed a lot of people because we didn't want to pay a little bit more money. Mm-hmm. Um, we asked politely. <laughs> I'm just saying there's, there's precedent, and it's clear, and it's obvious throughout time. And maybe one of the most dangerous things for democracy has been the increased power of, like, security technology. <laughs> Uh, they should be more scared, is all I'll say. Um, here's a lighter question. Uh, Jade, our doctorate okay. of questions, wants to know, best convention experience? I've never been Ooh. to a convention. Well, Johnny, if you don't want to partake in the conversation, why don't you just say so? <laughs> I No, I, I really haven't. I've never been to a convention. 
Uh huh. That's that's all right. I've only um, ever been to E3, and le- that's pretty well documented. It was mostly work. I didn't really get to enjoy much. I'm gonna I walk just... away for a second. I'll be back. Yeah. Bye, Johnny. So I my my best convention experience is my only, and it was for work. And I interviewed, and I held cameras, and I wrote articles. So I mean, I met some cool people. Hulk Hogan was there. That was before the racism. <laughs> They went, let's let's be clear. It was not before the racism. It was before the revelations of racism. It was before him uh, and Peter Thiel teamed up to destroy freedom of press. Yeah, they teach that, that case in law school. It's extremely important yeah. for the fact that you can be sued at any time, <laughs> even for things that are legal. Yeah, I would love it if uh, um, right before the class started, if the lights dimmed and then your professor walked into the Hulk Hogan theme. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty uh, good. Would, so if you t- if you turn to page uh, sixty three of the opinion, you'll see. Oh God, is that Hulk Hogan's music? Bam, 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 <laughs> bam, bam, bam. All right. Um, best convention experience for me. Um, Sorry, I wanted to check on my ribs. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Um, They're still broken. yours or or. Uh, okay okay um so let me think uh best convention experience my favorite convention is con bravo uh so it's probably something that happened there is that just because Um, you like tim horton so much no it's because it is the uh for one thing i i like the staff there for another thing um a lot of my friends go there for another thing they consistently book me so i am like a guest there like people come to see me Mm. Uh, and I appreciate that. Um, so that's fun for me. Mm. Um, yeah, I guess my my favorite uh, convention um, memories are autograph sessions where I get to talk to my fans and uh, like sign autographs. It usually happens early in the morning. I wake up early for conventions. I like to go to sleep at a reasonable hour because I usually room with uh, my friend and she like sleeps and wakes up at reasonable hours as opposed to everyone else who does conventions where they're like up until two in the morning, like having parties in their rooms. I hate that. Um, so, so, so I'm just up and then I go to convention to go to the uh, autograph sessions and everyone else on the autograph session is, looks a little tired and I'm all perky. Uh, so that's fun for me. Have you ever um, signed anything indecent? No, no, nothing like that. Um, uh, it's, it's usually, um, Usually books of things. I signed a backpack once. Um, things like that. It's not. There's nothing. There's nothing weird about Would it. Would you sign a buttock m- if I asked you to? Absolutely not. Um, if someone asked me to sign something like indecent, I would be like, I'm uncomfortable doing. Even this if it was me, me. Even if it was like Leon, please sign my buttock. Even if it was just like the <laughs> top where the curve starts. Uh, only if it's only if it's in permanent marker. Of, so of course, just... <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not saying you have to get a feather quill out and like right. dip it in an inkwell and be like, "Hang on, this is going to take a couple of passes." Yeah, um, yeah. So maybe, um, but yeah, I, I like, I like, I like um, just, meeting people. Sorry, in... Leon. Just so we're clear, oh my that's god, that's not an invitation for anybody listening to this podcast to ask that. Yeah, that is a bond no. that Leon and I share. Yeah, um, nobody really does that uh, to me, luckily. But yeah, th- those are my like uh, the things I like doing at conventions. Um, I will sign inside your butt cheeks. Wow! <laughs> I'll just get right in there. Just I don't give right a fuck. Right in. I'll shave for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll sign. I'll sign inside you if I can figure out. How. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Um, I just gotta, yeah. I just gotta borrow that camera. Yeah. Oh my god. You know the Stop. one I'm talking about. <laughs> Colonoscopy <Please. laughs> camera. Alright, um so yeah, no, there's Mike, the Mike... other way, Austin. Okay, we're gonna kill Leon. Jesus. Next next question. <laughs> okay. Um Zoan Lonoska asks, What is the worst fan base you've ever had an encounter with? Video games. Okay, that's very broad. I, this question jumped out to me because the Super Smash Brothers fan base has been extremely shitty following E3 uh, over the f- fact that the new game has assets from the last game, and that's yeah, just and how I'll, video I'll, games are made, y'all. I will bet you. I will bet you that all those people also are the shitty people who are like, "Ooh, PUBG is an asset flip because they used stuff from the Unity Store." 
Yeah, I've Trojan horsed a different conversation into your question, and I apologize, but I video games don't need to be made from scratch every time. That's like, we don't reinvent the camera for every film. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, how we don't many, have how to, many times do you have to, like, design a door? You don't have to program a new <laughs> word processor for every novel. Like, video games are made out of tools and parts, and... Listen, I love fresh new art as much as anyone, but there's you know no what? reason to redo ass- everything. John Wick is an asset flip because I've seen most of those actors in like a bunch of other movies. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. When they did the trailer for uh, the new Smash Brothers, now bear in mind, I've been out of video games for, for years and years. But when they showed the trailer for Smash Brothers, I'm like, wow, this, this looks amazing. Like everyone's going to love this. And like like a second later, I went on my timeline and people are like saying, "Why is everyone upset about this?" And I'm like, "What? This looks like they did everything they could have done to make this game cool. They had all the characters except one, and everyone's upset about it. Um, they have all the that, characters. I've voiced this in the past. I would have liked them to pay more attention to Solid Snake's butt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but like generally speaking, it, this seems like a like a really uh, great game for people who like this uh, game series." And somehow people aren't satisfied. It's like, okay, I mean, this is uh, this is the um, medium I've decided to try to do no, but again. Leon, don't this... you understand that as a creator, you owe me to do everything that I want? They yeah. they made all the objectively correct choices in making the new Smash Brothers. Literally put in the character everyone's been asking for and brought everything back. Everything looks amazing. Yeah, but There's Austin, music. you've ruined my childhood. <sighs> There's. <laughs> There's no reason to spend, like, fucking dozens of hours and spend god knows how much money having people remodel Mario and give them all new animations. Me me and a group of undisclosed numbers of fans, who are Uh named Jeff and Steve, um, are so upset with this that you've just tyrannically decided to erase our freedom as fans and paint me as being a pissed off bigot who tries to manipulate the conversation in a certain way that I'm going to write a treatise on why you should listen to me because you've destroyed everything that I love specifically about this one particular thing and you should do everything I say because I'm going to not pay you money. I hate that. Um, a related question, Jack Kane says, <laughs> this isn't really a question, but just says, I, don't, I didn't like The Last Jedi, and I'm getting really tired of alt-right pieces of shit making it impossible to have any actual discussions of the movie. Um, so Star Wars, definitely up there as far as shitty fan bases go. That was going to be my second choice. And I, Here's I the think thing. you guys may have detected that in my mm-hmm. discourse. But, yeah, the, uh, the, the shitty Star Wars fans aren't shitty Star Wars fans so much as they are the same shitty fans who will say the same uh, shitty things uh, about other media. These aren't like... Um, when people say, like, what is the worst fan base, th- it's it's more that... They're shitty asshole... people who infect whatever fan base they happen to be in. They're, yeah. they're angry, stupid people who want everything to revolve around them because they feel like they have nothing... And Star yeah, Wars like, just I, happens to be the, one of the biggest franchise, franchises on the planet. So just mathematically, yeah, if like 5% right. yeah. of any fandom is a dick. So look, yeah, it belongs look, ev- to me. <laughs> yeah, listen. Asshole, asshole Bob um, likes Star Wars and likes being an asshole about it. But he likes other things and being an asshole about it. The, the, I mean, I mean I'm, not, um, I'm not trying to like um, – saying to to say um, that Star Wars fans don't need to police their community because they do. But I'm saying that the the problem is assholes in a broad sense more than the problem is Star Wars. Um, So I don't don't know how to tackle that exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Do you guys – we've probably talked about bad fandoms before, but if if, whenever we talk about fandoms in general, it's always like – it's hard to recognize that most of the people are actually very good. They just don't say anything because they just enjoyed the yeah. art and they went about their day like fucking normal <laughs> yeah. people. I so. met guys. I met guys that were angry about the extended editions of Lord of the Rings because it was like, where was Tom Bombadil? <laughs> and it was like, he, detract, he detracts from the pacing. We lost you're nothing. Gonna, you're going to just like create a whole side story of the movie that has a musical number to like totally erase the mood and 
atmosphere and pacing, and, and they were like, I just wanted a pure version, man. I think they just wanted yeah. everyone to say, like, oh, you read the books, you're so smart. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Hey, doll, dairy doll. Jesus. I just don't understand <laughs> people who can't accept that Luke Skywalker might have changed that... in the last 20 years. Guess what? You know you know what people do when they get older? They get fucking cranky and their political opinions change. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, what do you what did you expect? Also, he saw um, his his adopted family die in a war and then he killed thousands of people. Yeah, he had to, he, look he went he went through some shit. Um if he if 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 in the last Jedi, um Ray just walked over to him and handed him the lightsaber, and he was like, "Let's you know go what kick I ass." Do? No, 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 not even that. If if he had if she handed him the lightsaber, and he's like, "Thanks," and now we got to go to Tashi Station for some power converters, <laughs> it would be like, "No, you you're past that. That's not who you are anymore." I saw it's, somebody. It would... I saw somebody say about it that Luke didn't care enough to travel to save his sister. Oh my and I was god, like, he cared I, too I, much. What? Like, yeah, dude, he sacrificed his life to project himself there. God, we're so fast and loose with the spoilers this week. What the fuck? fuck it. It's <laughs> on Netflix now. Yeah, it's. I'm Watch sorry. It's it. been like it's. It's been better part of a year. It's over. Okay. Um, deal with it. Um. So anyway, I um, liked the Last Jedi when it came out, but the more and more nerds are shitty about it i think it actually increases my love for it <laughs> and i don't want to i don't want to live my life like that i want to be a reactionary spiteful person but it's just like for every complaint they have just underscores how brave and like interesting the choices they made were every every, yeah. every single yes. crossroad yes. they took the more interesting choice the more the the things that they bring up when they're like well why i'm like Oh yeah, no, no, no! I get it. You know the reason why is <laughs> the reason why is because the the thing the other choice was to be boring and predictable, yeah. or just to fall back into old tropes, or like, to have a vague platitude, or to guys, do fucking nothing. You guys have seen that the page, like the full page decree, right? I saw a screencast of it going mm. around, and I didn't click on it because I don't hate myself no. that much yet. I, I did, yep. just because I do hate myself <laughs> quite a lot, actually. And there's a bit in it where they're like, they want to overturn the destruction of legacy characters. I'm like, okay, whatever. And at one point in time, they're like, yeah, because the death of Han Solo was so gratuitous, and it didn't move Kylo Ren's character forward any. And it was like, what? I yeah he lit <laughs> what he, he that doesn't make any sense he literally like um he finally becomes a conflicted character yeah. for one thing he and and he moves forward in a in a more like obvious sense in that he basically takes over the the new the first the order. empire he's uh, like I yeah. I am the authority now I don't want my yeah. father I don't want my master I don't want any of these people I'm the most powerful person in the galaxy. Yeah, if anything, he changed too much. Um, I mean, not 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 real, not really, but like the idea that like he didn't change enough is like ridiculous. There's so um, much. He, he Every sh- Star Wars critique uncovers a treasure trove of neuroses. All these yeah. people's view of the world is fucking terrifying. Like every time someone says like, "Oh, I don't like a movie," fine, but like when the, specifically the Last Jedi is like a fucking bug zapper for the psychic <laughs> damage our culture has inflicted. Inflicted on mostly young men, it is it is ghastly. Yeah, and it also I think in addition to that exposes the the everybody's a critic thing has reached like venomous levels because no, everyone thinks they are the smartest person ever when it comes to like analyzing media yeah. and like because they've watched every cinema sins episode ever. <laughs> Listen, I'm not trying to be mean, but like the average consumer doesn't care about any of that stuff and most of your like hot takes and stuff are just like differences of taste it's fine yeah Every- everyone yeah. chill yeah all right we need to go soon uh before we do i wanted to do uh a, a new segment to the show uh-huh. um called sassy or mean uh <laughs> where i look into where i look into the comment section of 
of my video. Uh-huh. And and I and I respond I responded to someone earlier today, and this is why I thought of it because I responded to someone, and I was like, I decided to be sassy, but I was like, that's also kind of mean, and I want to. Uh, do that uh, on this show um basically someone came into my comment section for the um for an episode and just to give you an idea of who this person is uh his channel is full of liked videos about um ayn rand pro trump stuff fox news stuff Mm -hmm. alex jones stuff propaganda um uh, a lot of stuff like that uh to give you some idea of who this individual is and he said to me they said no, it's definitely. I'm. I'm looking. I'm. I'm. I'm looking at his his face and his name, and I. 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 I feel like. I feel like it's okay to gender this person. All right. Um. In this case, he. Uh. He says. Um. I would rather die than live in one society with the scum that made this video. And I said in response, and you tell me if this is just sassy or if it's mean. Really? Well, we already are living in a society together. So, your move. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sa- sa- sassy or too mean? I think it's it's sassier than mean because mean feels like it requires you to bring an element of animus to it, and he brought yeah. that to you, and you just yeah. okay. kind of shown a you know a mirror or a light on it. So he was just like, dude, look at the grave you just dug. Yeah, yeah. You didn't bring okay, anything extra enough. to it. Okay, good. All right, I, I I felt weird about it, so I wanted to bring it into the show and also make a spectacle of it to hopefully get some entertainment out of this because that is what we do. Um, I'm done now. Uh, anyone have anything to say before we go? Yeah, one more question. Uh, Kane Twenty C on Twitter asks, "What is the current status of Come Watch?" <laughs> you nutting, dude? Not yet. Okay. Everyone wants to know. It's on the tip I'll of tell every. You what. <laughs> Listen, Johnny. The the cum is on the tip of everyone's tongue. They can't I'll stop talking about week. it. Oh God, Austin. Johnny, really. Johnny, Johnny. When it happens, just go on Twitter and make three exclamation points. <laughs> no, no, no. Because if I make three exclamation points, they're gonna mistake that for a band called Check Check Check. I don't know what that they means, but okay. as being three exclamation points. Yeah. Oh my God. Gotta, uh, hey, good poll. We have to have a code word. This is gonna be like when the uh, the guy who makes Dilbert says, "You'll know when Dilbert fucks because he'll change his tie." <laughs> okay, jo- Johnny, just yeah. say bazooka. No, no, no. It's not. Gonna be, <laughs> it's not gonna be bazooka. You know what it's gonna be? What is it? This great badness. No. <laughs> I hate this show. Baby!